Are you struggling to pass the CPA exam? Did your review course fail to fit your learning style? I'm Darius Clark of I-75 CPA Review, the number one course supplement, where the right teacher makes all the difference. All right, here's a ratio sim that you could see in audit, FAR, or BEC. So I thought what was needed was a sim on the three different types of ratio questions. In the first question, the exam gives you the financial statements and asks you to calculate the ratio. Here's the balance sheet, here's the income statement, calculate the quick ratio. Well, for that type of ratio question, you would need to know, you would have to have it memorized, the quick ratio. The most liquid current assets, cash, receivables, and short-term investments divided by all current liabilities. So for that type of question, you'd have to have that ratio in your pocket. But number two, the second type of ratio question, they give you the formula. They'll say, here's the quick ratio formula, cash plus receivables plus short-term investments divided by current liabilities. Then the exam will tell you that a transaction occurred. And did that transaction increase, decrease, or cause that ratio to stay the same? For that second type of ratio question, they would give you the formula so you wouldn't need to memorize it. You would just have to know what the impact on the ratio was from the transaction that occurred. Maybe cash was received from an inventory sale, and you'd have to know what's the impact on the quick ratio. For the third type of ratio question, they're going to tell you the ratio increased from 2 to 1 last year to 3 to 1 this year and ask you what is the most likely reason for the increase. And in this third type of ratio question, you're probably going to have the ratio provided to you. They'll probably tell you, here's the formula for the ratio. It went from two to one up to three to one. What's the most likely reason for the increase? And they'll say things like, is it because sales returns were not properly recorded? Or is it because consignment shipments were recorded as sales? Making number three here the toughest of the three types of ratio questions. And in this one, you'll usually see it on the audit exam. You're more likely to see number three on the audit exam than you are FAR or BEC. But of course, one and two, you're likely to see it on either FAR, audit, or BEC. Now, are they going to provide you the ratio in number three? They're asking you what's the most likely reason for the increase or decrease in a particular ratio. Are they going to give you the formula? Well, they will if it's one of those rare, not so common ratios. But if it's something like inventory turnover, and they ask you, why did the inventory turnover ratio increase from two to one to three to one? They're gonna already expect that you know that ratio. Same for receivables turnover, or the quick ratio, or the current ratio. But if they give you some weird off the wall ratio and ask you why did it increase or decrease, then they'll probably provide you with the ratio. So if they give you a ratio like capital expenditures ratio or operating cash flow ratio, these aren't ratios you see every day on the exam. They'll probably provide you with the ratio then if they're asking you for the most likely reason for the increase or decrease. So three types of ratio questions. Let's get started. Number one, the current ratio equals current assets divided by current liabilities. And assuming the current ratio starts above one to one, and 5,000 of cash was used to pay down accounts payable, what is the impact on the current ratio? Did it increase, decrease, or no impact? So this is the type of ratio question where they're asking you, how does this given transaction impact the ratio provided? So current ratio, we know that means current assets divided by current liabilities, and the transaction is $5,000 of cash was paid and accounts payable was reduced. So the journal entry was good to know there would be a debit to accounts payable and a credit to cash. Both current liabilities and cash are going down and they're going down by the same amount. Cash is in the numerator of the current ratio and accounts payable is in the denominator of the current ratio. Does that mean that the current ratio is going to stay the same? We're going to go with no impact here? Well, at first glance, it certainly seems like there's no change. If you took the same amount from the numerator as the denominator, why would the ratio change? What if I told you that not only is the current ratio going to change, but it's going to increase? 
And it's all because the ratio starts above one to one, they told us in the facts. What does that mean, one to one? Well, for the current ratio, it means $1 of current assets for every $1 of current liabilities. And it's starting above that. So let's say since the ratio is starting above one to one, let's say it's starting at three to two. $3 of current assets for every $2 of current liabilities. And if we reduce the numerator and denominator by the same amount, we go from three to two, take one away from both sides, we go to two to one. We go from three over two to two over one, all by taking one away from both numerator and denominator. Well, what does that do? Well, we started out at three to two, which is one and a half to one. We ended up at two to one, which is two to one. That's an increase in the ratio. And that'll happen with any ratio that starts above one to one. If you take away the same amount from both numerator and denominator, the ratio will increase. Notice it didn't matter whether this was the current ratio or the acid test ratio or the CapEx ratio or the inventory turnover ratio. If you're starting above one to one and you take away the same amount from both top and bottom, numerator and denominator, the ratio will increase. Why did we take away the same amount? Because they told us that $5,000 of cash was used to pay down accounts payable. So that means numerator, cash is the numerator of the current ratio. Cash goes down and accounts payable, which is the denominator in the current ratio, accounts payable goes down. They both go down by the same amount. So we could substitute $5,000 for one because we're starting above one to one, let's say at three to two, and we're gonna substitute 5,000 for just one by going from three to two down to two to one. And that means we started at one and a half to one and we ended up at two to one, which is an increase. We went from $1.50 of current assets for every $1 of current liabilities. We went from one and a half to one to $2 of current assets for every $1 of current liabilities. We went from 1.5 to one up to two to one. The ratio increased. Didn't have all that much to do with accounting or auditing, just a little math. Now at I-75, we always try to anticipate the next question. So you might be wondering, what if the ratio started below one to one? Okay. Now we're gonna look at the quick ratio, which equals the most liquid current assets divided by current liabilities. And the quick ratio is gonna start below one to one. And they tell us $3,000 of cash was used to pay down accounts payable. What is the impact on the quick ratio? So once again, we're taking cash and paying down accounts payable, debit accounts payable, credit cash. Journal entry is exactly the same as it was in the previous question. And the quick ratio is similar to the current ratio like we looked at in number one, in that cash is gonna be in the numerator and accounts payable is gonna be in the denominator and both are going down by the same amount, in this case, $3,000. But watch what's gonna to happen to the ratio. Is it gonna stay the same? No, you're too smart for that. You know it's not. It's going to be impacted, isn't it? Is the ratio going to increase again because we're taking away the same amount from numerator and denominator? Or is it gonna decrease this time? Does it have anything to do with the fact that it's starting below one to one this time instead of above one to one? Well, since the ratio starts below one to one, let's say it starts at two to three. Do we agree that two to three is below one to one? For the quick ratio, two to three means $2 of most liquid current assets for every $3 of current liabilities. You'd rather be higher than that. You'd rather be above one to one, but they're not. They're below one to one. And two to three happens to work out to 0.6667. Now, if we reduce the numerator and denominator by the same amount, once again, we'll take one away from numerator and denominator. Then we go from two to three to one to two just by taking one away from both sides. We go from two to three, take away one from both, we get to one to two. What did we do? We went from 0.667 to 0.50. That's a decrease in the ratio. How much auditing was involved there? Nothing. Accounting? Very little, if any. It's all math. So when they give you a transaction and ask you what's the impact on the ratio, watch out 
for when the numerator and denominator have to go up or down by the same amount because the ratio is going to be impacted. Now let's go on to a different type of ratio question. Here they're going to give you some financial statement figures and ask you to just calculate, in this case, the receivables turnover ratio. Calculate receivables turnover given all of this. And usually that means they give you way more than you need and you just got to take what you need and leave the rest. So what is receivables turnover? First of all, you got to make sure you're not answering inventory turnover if they ask for receivables turnover. Receivables turnover is net credit sales divided by average accounts receivable, beginning plus ending receivable divided by two. Well, I don't see net credit sales. I see net cash sales. Ignore that. I see cost of goods sold. That's a distractor. I see beginning inventory and purchases irrelevant, right? We want sales on credit net. So 135,000 minus if there's any sales returns and allowances on these credit sales. So subtract the 30,000 from the 135. So your net credit sales is 105 and then divide by average accounts receivable, beginning plus ending divided by two. So you'd have your 105,000 for net credit sales divided by average receivables of 21,000 and that's five times. So the answer is your receivables turnover would be a five timer. Obviously in that type of ratio question, you had to have the ratio memorized. It had to be in your pocket. Now what they'll do in a question like that, because I'm gonna give you the same facts again, or very similar, they could ask you, how much were the net credit sales if we give you the receivable turnover ratio? So we're telling you receivable turnovers five times, we're telling you beginning and ending receivables, how much were net credit sales? So this is just a variation on a simple ratio question, like calculate the receivables turnover ratio. No, 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 not this time. Here's the receivable turnover ratio. Can you figure out what the net credit sales were? And most candidates are like, oh, I wasn't ready for that. But at I-75, we always try to anticipate the next question. Once again, the hard part would be to just disregard all the distractor information and just focus on five receivable turnover ratio and five equals net credit sales, which we don't know, divided by average accounts receivable. So then five equals net credit sales, which we don't know, divided by 21,000 because average receivables we can calculate as beginning plus ending divided by two. And once we know two out of the three factors to determine the net credit sales, we can multiply them. Five equals your receivable turnover times 21,000, which is your average accounts receivable. Your net credit sales have to be 105,000. I would expect a question very similar to that on your exam. Now we're only halfway through this sim and you can find this sim in the I-75 final review chapter. Now, if you're finding this ratio video helpful, go to cpaexamtutoring.com and get yourself on I-75, where the right teacher makes all the difference.